Okay, good morning. Uh, I'm Jim Hellis. I'm still the chairman of Dinas. I've, I've survived uh, a weekend at TWS this year. And we're going to talk this morning about Carl von Clausewitz. The next two days are studying Clausewitz, um, one of the most influential theorists on, uh, and, and writers and scholars on military thought. And so we're going to spend some time this morning talking about uh, an introduction to, to kind of set things up and give some context to the discussions over the next two days. And we're going to look at three subjects. We're going to look at who is Clausewitz. Look at the man, talk about the man, talk about the times, talk about the book on war, you know, vom Kriege. Um, where did it come from? What were the origins? How did he write it? And finally, cover just a couple of the key ideas in the book that we're going to talk to on the next couple of days. Okay, and that's, that's a picture of Clausewitz in his Prussian uniform. Emphasize Prussian. We'll come to that in a few minutes. Unlike... Thucydides and Sunza, uh, the two scholars we've talked about in here earlier, we know a lot about Clausewitz. Um, we're only going back 200 years in history. We have pretty good military records from the Prussians on, on his career. Uh, born in 1780 in Berg, his dad had served as a lieutenant, was a minor official in the uh, tax collection service in the Prussian bureaucracy. He enters the army at age 12, 1792 sees his first combat in 1793, and continues to serve until his death in 1831. Now, talk about his career. It spans the period of the Napoleonic Wars. His first campaign in 1793 is in the war to contain the French Revolution, where the old powers in Europe, the feudal states, combined in coalition to first try to overthrow the revolution, and then as a minimally to contain it. And he fights in the Rhineland and at the Siege of Mainz. Um, and the war ends up in essentially, you know, militarily, essentially a stalemate. The revolution survives inside of France. The old regime survived. They come to an accommodation. The conclusion of the war, he goes into garrison duty for the next four or five years. And he's in a regiment that has a royal patron who believes in education. And so the regiment's required to undertake a formal program of education for the junior officers. So again, at the young age of 14 or 15, he begins his study and what he talks later about, what we say today, lifelong learning, a life of self-education that is not just related uh, to military matters, but takes in philosophy, the arts, literature, and history. He's a big believer in the study of history as a way of testing theory and gathering data to develop theory. 1801, he is admitted to the New War Academy, founded in Berlin. Uh, while there, in his last year, he meets a woman who's to become his future wife, who's a lady-in-waiting at the court. He graduates in 1804, number one in his class. Uh, precocious in, in his ability to think at the high, at the strategic levels. Shortly after graduation, he is already beginning to publish papers on theory of war. Now, he's not, at this point, putting forward his own theories, but he's providing critique of the existent theories of war. And it gets a lot of attention, one, because of his young age, and two, because he's publicly criticizing, in writing, the theories and the writings of senior Prussian officers. But he's regarded as a, as a rising talent in, in the army. He is assigned to a grenadier battalion that is commanded by one of the princes. He serves as the adjutant. And in 1806, sees his next campaign. Uh, very brief war between Napoleonic France, between Napoleon and Prussia. Uh, war basically ends in about a day and a half at Jena and Auerstadt. His battalion uh, serves as part of the rear guard as the Prussian army flees from the battlefield, uh, fights until they're out of ammunition, surrounded, cut off, and surrender. When the French capture the battalion, they realize the commander is a member of the royal family. This may be of some value to them in a negotiation. So the prince and his adjutant, Clausewitz, are shipped off to France. And Clausewitz spends about the next year interred in France. Technically a prisoner of war, but he is given a lot of latitude, he and the prince, to, for what we say is freedom of movement, to travel about and study inside of France. And so he is able to observe firsthand what the revolution and what Napoleon have wrought. He sees the administrative improvements. He sees the meritocracy that France has become as opposed to the feudal state that Prussia remains. He sees the economic mobilization. 
Probably more importantly for his thoughts on war, he sees the effect of the levy on mass and the mass mobilization of the population with all national efforts going into supporting the war effort. He returns to Prussia in 1808, and under Scharnhorst, who had become one of his mentors, uh, becomes part of a small cadre of officers who began to reform the Prussian army. Uh, you know, whilst, whilst hanging can focus the mind, you know, one's imminent hanging can focus one's mind, as uh, Samuel Bosworth wrote, um, defeat in war can focus the thinking of an army. And the Prussian army was humiliated in, in 1806. And so a reform movement is underway. Clausewitz is one of the senior staff officers working at this. Again, it's very precocious. He's 28 when he returns from France. And so at the age of 30, he is working on matters at the national level from the army, everything from training to doctrine to equipping to education to promotion system to mobilization and so on. He sees the full range of activities it takes for the state to put together and field an army. Stuff we'll study later in, in DEM, in this course, how we do it today. He's also lecturing, interestingly, at the Kriegs Academy on a number of subjects, including partisan warfare. And where is that going on at the time of, uh, that he's doing this lecturing? It's in Spain, the Napoleonic War. Um, and we understand from SSI that, that those are being translated, and we may have translations from the German into English sometime next year. But he has, a, he has an influential position in the Prussian army. Uh, at this period, he marries. But he also falls under suspicion in some ranks of, of the senior ranks of the army. He's been a critic of Blücher and some other senior generals in, in his writings. And they're concerned that he has drunk the French Kool-Aid, okay, that he is trying to bring the French Revolution you know, surreptitiously into Prussia. 1812. Uh, Napoleon demands that Prussia, that he be allowed to use Prussia as a base of operations for his invasion of Russia. He also levies upon Prussia and they agree to provide a corps for the Grand Armée. When Napoleon goes into Russia, it is not a French army, but it's an army of all the nations, of conquered nations of Europe. Clausewitz and several other pr Prussian officers, but Clausewitz being the most prominent, sees this as an abrogation of national sovereignty and an act of political irresponsibility. He resigns his commission, gets on the horse and heads east, and offers his services to the Tsar. He is commissioned colonel in the Russian army and serves with the Russians in the campaign against Napoleon. Now, he doesn't speak Russian, so that limits his, his role. He serves mainly as an observer, does some advisory work. His key role was in December of 1812, as Napoleon begins his retreat, Clausewitz negotiates the defection of that Prussian corps from the Grand Armée back to the coalition, and that corps will fight against Napoleon in the campaigns of 1813 that uh, ultimately result in Napoleon's overthrow. He returns to Prussia, again serves in uh, the 1813, 1814 campaigns. In 1815, during Napoleon's return, he serves as the chief of staff of the, of the Third Prussian Corps in the Waterloo campaign. Uh, his corps is not he is not with Blucher's Corps, which saves the day at Waterloo, but he's in the Prussian Corps that is defeated about three days before the Battle at Ligny. But again, he fights all the way through the Napoleonic period. End of the war, he goes back into garrison service. Again, he's, he's been viewed with suspicion because he's not only been living in France, but now he's jumped over and, and served with the Russians. But he's connected. Scharnhorst, his mentor, was killed in 1813, but Gneisenau is now taking him under his wing. His wife is connected at court, so what do you do with him? You kick him upstairs. Uh, he is promoted to Major General in 1818, and he is assigned as the president of the War College. That's, that's what it was. Now, the presidency of the War College was, was not a, a teaching or academic position. It was more an administrative, managerial role. And he described himself, described the duties as not very demanding on his intellect, and frankly, tedious. So what does he do with the situation? He's been a lifelong scholar of war. He's been a lifelong student of war. He has experienced and seen war from the age of 12 in an infantry battalion. He's a career infantry officer, which is not a bad way to spend your life. Um, all the way up to a corps chief of staff, has served in a coalition army with the Russians, and has served at the national level. So he has seen war from the point of the bayonet all the way up to the level of policy. 
And so he decides to spend these 12 years primarily engaged in research, study, and writing on the theory of war. He serves at the War College until 1830, 12 years. He is then branch transferred, in effect, into the field artillery at the major general level. Uh, is assigned to the inspector general of the field artillery, so he has to immediately become familiar with his, the technical aspects of the artillery. Late 1830, um, there is unrest in France. There had been a Bourbon restoration after Napoleon. There's unrest in France. There's a revolt uh, underway in Poland. The Prussian army is partially mobilized to go to the frontiers to prevent any infection of this revolutionary contagion from seeping into Prussia. He is assigned to the east under Gneisenau as the chief of staff of the field force in the east. And whilst the revolution does not spread into Prussia, the plague does. And he contracts cholera as the plague spreads across Europe, and he dies prematurely in late 1831 at the age of 51. His great work uh, that he had done at the War College, he's published some articles in it, but the great book on war that we know today is unpublished. It is sitting in boxes. Um, back at the house with the wife when, when he passes away at the end of 1831. So how do we get, so how do we get the book? <clears throat> how did he put it together? Does this look familiar, the quote? Remind us of anybody? Yes, Thucydides. His goal was to create a work that would last more than a week or two that would be picked up a couple of times and would be something enduring on the theory of war. That was his ambition when he started it, as he, as he wrote himself in 1818, at the beginning of his work. This is how he started. And all of you are working on theory of war and strategy, so this may be where you're starting. basically put down on paper the ideas of what are the things that I've learned about war over my career, and then I'm going to begin to try to organize this into some comprehensive, understandable theory of war. And his audience is hopefully the same audience of your FIs that you're writing for right now, someone who has some familiarity with the subject. He's writing for the professionals. Hopefully you will not, you know, this is his self-assessment after nine years. In 1827, he wrote a note to the introduction, still unpublished work. Hopefully you will not be reading this or thinking this about your own papers. Again, he was not satisfied with the work as it was in 1827, um, after nine years of work. And note, needs to be thoroughly reworked once more. Okay, at this point he has finished the first six of the eight books that he had planned, planned for the work, and he's not happy with it. And he explains to them, why am I not happy with the work? And this is where we begin to try to understand some of the, the, the key thoughts in his, his theory of war. First off, he said, I need to clarify in the book what I mean by two types of war. And in the note, what he wrote was, the first type of war is that war in which the object is to render our, our adversary, our enemy, politically and militarily helpless so we can impose our will upon him. Almost what we would call today total war. The second kind of war, as he wrote in the note, is that in which the objective is to seize some small territory, some lands on the frontier, to be used as a tool, as a bargaining chip in negotiations with our adversary. Again, a much more limited approach to war. So he's talking about what we would talk about as total and limited war, that he needed to, to clarify that better in the work. He didn't think it came through well enough. And then the other is, is his famous dictum, you know, war is a continuation of policy. Again, he said it must be absolutely clear that war is nothing more than the continuation of policy, and that this idea needs to infuse all six books. It is not, in his view, had not been clearly threaded and woven throughout his work, and he wanted to make sure that that was put in. He believed from his note that he needed to first finish book eight, what we call today book eight, 
which was what he saw as would be the summing up where all the theory would come together. And that after he finished book eight, which he said, I was in draft now, it's some notes, it's kind of okay, but it's not where I want it to be. Then I have to go back and rewrite the whole first six books, which is most of what we have today in, in the Howard version. And when I rewrite them, they'll become a lot smaller because there's a lot in there that will fall away as we emphasize this point about war as an instrument of policy. That's what he wrote about himself, uh, his own views of the work as he went on. Now, he was prescient. In the note he wrote, now, in the event of my untimely death, those are his words, should somebody choose to publish this, they need to understand that it is an incomplete work. And, and it will be very easy for fools and those who don't understand it. And most people, he said, won't understand it because they aren't going to be bright enough. Um, maybe why he was kicked upstairs, too candid sometimes. Um, but he said there would be utility in the publication of the incomplete work. Again, part of it there, you can see the recognition of a, literally a lifetime of study and research on the subject. But finally, that you know, there, there are actually good ideas in this work that others can pick up on and continue to move forward with, even if I'm unable to complete it. So it would be worthy of publication at some point. So how do we get it published? Enter Mrs. Clausewitz. She finds the works at home nicely sealed up in boxes where he had sealed them up in 1830, where they had sat for the last year and a half of his life. And she actually writes the preface to the original version of On War that's published in Germany or in Prussia in 1832. And she said, you know, I told him for years that, hey, you just need to go ahead and publish this. You can always do the second edition later, but you need to get this thing out in public view. And she relates, his response was, it's not ready, it's not ready, it's not ready. And finally, one day he told me, he said, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to be finished with this. You'll be the one to publish it after my death. And that's, that's indeed what happened. Uh, she acknowledges in the preface that, you know, there was quite a bit of sorting we had to do going through his boxes and boxes of papers. Okay, you'll see this with your SRPs later, those who've done graduate school. 18 years of research and writing, you've probably got a few notes, and there's no hard drives in. So there's a period of going through the papers, sorting them out, getting the books organized, she acknowledges in the preface that we found in revision notes for much of the work, and to the extent we could, we worked those in. So she plays a hand with some colleagues in doing some editing of the work, trying to pull off of what thoughts he had put down. But she arranges for the publication of the book. What influence does it have um, over, over time? Again, it's first published in 1832. Isn't a big hit when it comes out. Um, one limitation of the work is that it's published in German, and in the 19th century, not a very accessible language. Um, French was the common intellectual language of the time. Not much was being translated from German into other languages uh, in, in early and mid, mid 18th and 19th century, so it's not accessible, does not have a wide audience. First comes to prominence as a work under von Moltke the Elder. He served on the Prussian general staff for 60 years, served as the chief of the general staff for 30 years, including the period of the wars of German unification, Franco-Prussian War, and the Bismarck era. He was known to read it, reread it, reread it, was an avid fan of the work, <clears throat> and as in most armies, if the chief of the general staff, you know, and he's there for 30 years, is reading this thing all the time, it gets on everybody's bookshelf in the Prussian army and in the general staff. So it is probably, we believe it's, it's widely read in the late 19th century in, in the Prussian army. Now, we're not sure how well understood it is, because while Clausewitz you know, clearly puts out war as an instrument of policy, von Moltke said at one point, once the mobilization begins, the politicians should fall silent. And so a disconnect between Clausewitz's idea of war as an instrument of policy and von Moltke's effort, belief that, that permeated the German general staff that once the war begins, the politicians get out of the way and the soldiers take care of business. So maybe not a, as clear an understanding of the work as Clausewitz would have wanted. There were French and English translations in the late 19th century. Uh, first, the English translation in 1874, but only off of a partial work of Clausewitz. It didn't gain any traction. Uh, the British Army took an interest in it around 1903, 1904, not for an interest in the work, but 
seeing the rising conflict, uh, the potential for conflict with Germany, the thought was maybe we should read what they're reading so we can see inside of their minds. Uh, so there is some picking up, some use of the book in the early 20th century by the British and French, mainly to try to understand German military thought. We know that Japan used the work, uh, was influenced by Clausewitz in the formation of their army in the, the late 19th century as they modernized, as they went into the uh, Russo-Japanese War. They had hired a Prussian general, German general, who was an advocate of Clausewitz, and when the British at one point contacted him and said, would you be interested in working in some kind of collaboration on getting Clausewitz into a language we could share, the Japanese reply was, it's a good work, we already have it and use it. Um, haven't been, I haven't seen or read of any Japanese translations, but they clearly were influenced by, Klaus, by Clausewitz or were interested in it. Put the USA last. Uh, there, there is scant evidence that Clausewitz was studied in the American Army any time prior to World War II. Uh, part of it, again, is the inaccessibility, the lack of good translations. Now, the first okay translation was, was 1943, and it's probably an, only an okay translation. The accepted, you know, the, the Howard and Perret version that we use is, you know, kind of the accepted version, the best translation available. First see Clausewitz taking root in American military thought, not on the uniform side, but on the civilian side, and in the 1950s. And it was kind of in a response to two phenomena from the 50s. What, what might those have been? Nuclear weapons and, in parallel, limited war. Okay, nuclear weapons, which can take war to that absolute. Clausewitz talks about if you take war away from and disconnected from policy, it just becomes an absolute, and it becomes mindless, endless destruction. Well, with nuclear weapons, you've now got that capacity at hand. It's not a theoretical. You've also got limited war, war connected and limited and constrained by policy. One of Clausewitz's tenets was the, the amount of effort to be made, the amount of resources to be put forward in a war should match the object you're seeking. So you see limited war and nuclear weapons coming together in the 50s, and essentially primarily Bernard Brody, Charles Osgood, began explicitly talking about Clausewitz and Clausewitzian theory in the 50s during the Cold War period. And if you pick up War and Politics by Brody, you'll find that you know, the, the red book you've got, he, he frequently cites Clausewitz as one of his influences. So that's the influence of the book over time. Um, it is only gained in time, uh, and again, with the, the uh, Howard and Perret translation, it has become a staple of uh, military colleges in, in, in the West. Um, an interesting side note, again, the accessibility issue, once we got into a decent English translation, uh, a few years ago, we had one of a German international fellow came through and said he actually preferred reading it in the English rather than in his native German. It made more sense in English than, to him than it did in German. So relating to the accessibility issue. But that's, that's how we get the book, and that's how we get, uh, <laughs> and you're going to go, you're the same. Um, no, we know, yeah. yeah, I said a few years ago. Okay. Okay, what are some of the key ideas that we can glean from Clausewitz? First question is, why do you need a theory of war? You know, what's, what's the purpose and use of theory? Well, first, you know, he's experienced war and, and you know, war is a confusing, dirty business, highly complex, run from the individual level to the state level. And again, theory, try to bring these things together, bring clarity to the ideas, the concepts that, have, as he said, become confused and entangled. Second purpose, he says, is to help educate the mind of the future commander. In the next sentence, he said, it actually is a way of beginning the self-education of the future commander. So that when you come upon something that you've encountered before, everything is in its place. You don't have to start anew every time you look at a subject, every time you come to the subject of war. But he said, it is not something that you take to the battlefield. He said, just as you don't take your teacher to work with you once you graduate from school and go off into business, neither should you drag the theory with you to the battlefield. It educates the mind, it teaches you how to think, it prepares you to deal with situations. It's again part of the education process. And finally, he saw this as a, you know, what we call it a critical thinking exercise, a thorough inquiry into this phenomenon of war that is so critical, that is perhaps the most critical function performed by the state, certainly one that is involved in state survival. 
so that we have a clear understanding of war in all its facets and all its aspects. So that when we approach it, we go into it, we know what we're talking about and what we're thinking about when we, when we talk about war. Now, why does he feel that the theory needs to be revolutionized? Well, his views on the theory of his time, and this probably got him into trouble with some of his superiors, and the quotes are from Clausewitz himself. He wrote that. He felt all the theory we have right now is absolutely useless. Okay, and why did he feel that way? Theory at the time tended to be about developing rules and principles of war. And a lot of it was simply about supply bases, lines of operation, distance between supply bases, distance between the last base and the front line, right down to what are the angles of approach you should take when, when, when attacking the enemy. And you can maneuver your way. If you successfully line all the geometry up, you can get, you can get to success in war. And he believed, you know, you're looking for fixed mathematical solutions. It's not a science. It's an art. And he talks explicitly about war is not the art of war. What we would call today the human dimension. He felt that the theory was sterile. It didn't account for human factors in war that he had personally seen at the point of bayonet as a teenager. And that it's an interaction of opposites. Okay, what we say today, what, what do we say today about war in terms of the interaction? The enemy gets a vote, okay? The theory at the time was fairly sterile. If you do this and this and this and move along these lines and follow these rules, all will work. As Clausewitz said, there's an enemy out there. He gets a vote. War is a series of interactions between two living entities, the armies of the two sides, the two states that are, that, that are, in, that are in conflict. And in this interaction, you could follow every one of the rules that are written down, that they've written down, and lose and you can break every one of the rules and win, depending upon the circumstance, the human element, and how, you react to how your adversary is reacting. And he said, look at history, and history will tell you that you can break the rules and get away with it. And he saw Napoleon as one of the rule breakers. But that's what he thought about previous theory. That's why he believed theory needed to be up updated. Now, what are some of the key ideas? Now, if you look in Clausewitz, you can find everything from the role, if you read the whole book, the role of the non-commissioned officer, you can find passages that tell you that you need to have a good PT program, about marksmanship, about training, everything. How to set a camp, it is comprehensive from beginning to end. <clears throat> For what we're looking at here, studying war at the strategic level, what are, what are some of his big ideas? Again, can't walk away from Clausewitz without the one that he said was absolutely critical. War is an instrument of policy. War is waged by the state to achieve state objectives. And that battle is the decisive means in war. Remember, you know, 8th, 17th, 18th century, talk of maneuver warfare, you maneuver on the battlefield and you get to the proper position and you try to get to win, as Sunza said, try to win without fighting. Clausewitz rejected that. You know, he defined war an act of force to compel our enemy to do our will. And then he underlined, we are talking about physical force, not moral force. He saw battle, conflict, killing as, a, as the essential in war. That's what made it war, and that's how you impose your will, by physical force on, on your adversary. This idea of maneuvering and winning without fighting, that Sun Tzu was, of which Sun Tzu was an advocate, he would reject. <clears throat> and again, as opposed to the certainty that some of the theorists tried to bring to the battlefield through rules and order, Friction and fog are inevitable. Friction, the thousand little things that can go wrong that are beyond your control, that are beyond the control of the commander. Friction is an inevitability in war. And fog is an inevitability. Intelligence, you can read about what he thought about intelligence. He basically wasn't, wasn't, did, must have had a bad S2 at some point in his life because he didn't believe in the value of intelligence. He was a believer that the first report is always wrong. It is always incomplete. There is an inadequacy of information. And the winning commander, the great commanders, are those who can work through friction, identify friction on the adversary side, and take advantage of it. And those who, as he talks about, can follow that inner light so you can see through the fog and confusion of war 
and see your way through to victory. But fog and friction are inevitable in war. You can't get rid of them. What you have to do is understand that they're present and how to deal with them. Which comes to take us to the paradoxical trinity. I see, you know, Clausewitz, you know, some people say, well, the, the trinity was the army, the state, and the people. That's not how Clausewitz saw the trinity. He said, you know, that they relate to the, it relates to the army, the people, and the, and the government, but the trinity of war. Violence, hatred, enmity. It is about violence. And he sees this not only as a soldier, but he sees this in his travels in France, where the society is totally mobilized to support the war effort. But war is about violence. Chance and probability. Again, but with the, what's often left off, within which the creative spirit can, should be able to work freely. There's an element of chance, there's an element of probability, you have to work in that environment. And finally, the point that he continues to hammer home, the subordination of war is an, is an instrument of policy, which, mean, which is reason. So war, the trinity of war, paradoxical, violence, reason, and then probability and chance as it plays out in, in, in battle, as it plays out in life. And so if that's what war is, what should the theory of war look like? In his words, suspended between three magnets. How do you account for this phenomenon, this activity of war that is dominated by violence and hatred, is riven with chance, friction, fog, things that are the unpredictable, but must be guided by reason as an instrument of state to achieve policy aims of the state. How do you pull the three into balance? Okay. The great man, again, in his Prussian uniform. That's just a quick overview of, of the man, his life, the work, how he developed it, and just a few of the key ideas. I thank you for your attention. Uh, Enjoyed kicking it around for the next couple of days and to the FIs after a prudent and reasonable break back up to seminar. Thank you.